Welcome to Asia Society Hong Kong Center um, for the program uh, today that we're presenting. We're going to talk about the permanent home for Asia Society Hong Kong. And this is a follow-up program from a program we did on February 9th uh, this year, um, the anniversary, the ninth anniversary of when we opened the center at, on, in, on 9 Justice Drive in Admiralty. So we're really delighted that we have um, uh, David Newman back to talk to us in more detail about the process uh, in terms of preparing design for the building that we are now, uh, we really are fortunate to occupy as Asia Society Hong Kong Center uh, because the program really got started because David has some great information and background that many of us uh, did not know. And a lot of it is architecturally related in terms of the process uh, of preserving and heritage site. I wanna remind people that Asia Society Hong Kong was one of the first uh, that received the um, uh, permission from the government to adapt adaptive reviews of a heritage site so that we can um, convert it into now an arts and cultural hub. We've been using it, occupying for nine years. And so we're really delighted um, David is back. Uh, David and the late Richard, Professor Richard Weinstein, uh, former Dean and Graduate School of Architectural and Urban Planning, UCLA, were the two key players to really help us uh, with the process. And, uh, and I think he's going to tell you more about how it got started uh, in really in the late 1990s um, is when we, Asia Society Hong Kong, the trustees decided that it was time to have a permanent home. And if Asia Society was going to have a permanent home in Hong Kong, how would we go about it? And then um, this is, that was when Professor Weinstein and um, uh, uh, David came into uh, the picture to help us with the process. So with that, I'm going to get started and by introducing our moderator um, today, uh, I'm going to really delighted Rick Lamb is joining us as today's moderator. Rick is the co-founder and director of Architecture Commons. Um, he received his bachelor's degree from Hong Kong University and his graduate degree from Harvard. He has extensive work experience in Hong Kong, Tokyo, Boston, and New York on project that spans every scale. Uh, in the past several years in Hong Kong, Rick has been working with the government, nonprofits, uh, NGOs, and the private sector to tackle a mixture of deep-rooted social issues from alienated youth, elderly care, environment, to health and education. Most notably, the former Fan Ling Magistracy Revitalization and the Taipo Youth, Ho youth Hostel uh, that both have won awards from the uh, American Institute of Architect. Rick is a recipient of the 40 Under 40 Awards and also assistant professor in architecture at Chu Hai College of Hong Kong. So for that, I'm going to turn it over to Rick to get our program started today to talk about permanent home for a uh, Asia Society Hong Kong. Thank you, Rick, and thank you, David. You're welcome. Thank you, Alice, <clears throat> for your kind introduction. Uh, hello and welcome everyone, and good evening to David, who is joining us tonight from San Francisco. I'm the host for this webcast. My name is Rick Lam. First of all, thank you to Asia Society and also AIA Hong Kong chapter for arranging this conversation. And I'm honored to be here with Mr. David Newman, a true expert in university planning and design. David is the founding principal of New Campus Planning, a planning and programming consultancy that offers a unique 360 degrees surface that draws from David's experience as both an internal administrator and an external consultant. He brings more than 40 years of professional experience in design, in higher education and campus planning. He has served in many distinguished positions for University of Virginia, Stanford, UC Irvine, UC Santa Barbara, <clears throat> University of Nebraska System, and University of ha Hawaii Oahu. He is a fellow of the AIA and a recipient of the California Council AIA Corporate Architect Award and also major awards from the National Trust for Historic Preservation and the California Governor's Office. One of the many highlights in David's career was serving as the advisor for the Asia Society Design Competition Selection Committee. And tonight we'll be covering many of the obstacles and fascinating stories behind the realization of one of the most impressive adaptive reuse projects in Hong Kong. Now, before I pass over to David, let me share a, a brief backstory of how the site uh, came into the spotlight. It was exactly 23 years ago in June of 1998, when the government published the plans 
to widen Kennedy Road. What it exactly entailed was a four lane road bridge spanning across the valley above the magazine area, and also a four lane two way road connecting Kennedy Road with um, Justice Drive. So if this plan were to proceed, uh, the magazine area would surely be ruined by the retaining walls and also bridge supports. Fortunately, this plan was um, actually shot down by the Antiquities Advisory Board. And coincidentally, like Alice mentioned, Asia Society was searching for a new home. So the rest was actually history and the reason why we are all here today. So without further ado, let me pass it to David to introduce first the site, the heritage evaluation approach, and also how the competition was formulated. Thank you, David. Thank you, Rick. Um, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, how I became involved, uh, Richard uh, Weinstein and I knew each other by reputation, but not in fact. Uh, in fact, I was a um, PhD candidate at UCLA in planning, but it was before uh, Richard became the Dean. Uh, I knew uh, Richard's reputation from New York City, where he was uh, responsible for the urban uh, design board in uh, uh, what the mayor's advisory commission uh, and was uh, very uh, much in the front line of looking at urban design in a different way for a large city uh, like New York. Um, but I had not met him. And he heard of me because I was in the, at UC Irvine and then later at Stanford and um, our paths had crossed because we had a lot of mutual acquaintances. And uh, I was at the time the university architect at Stanford when Chen Li was a board of trustees member and the president at Stanford at the time, Gerhard Kasper, uh, and I had talked when he first arrived at the campus and he thought the idea of introducing uh, limited design competitions was a way for the university to improve uh, its architectural character from what he observed had been occurring, uh, frankly, prior to my arrival. And I was quite open to the idea of working directly with the president in trying to develop a process that would be a level playing field as much as possible, invited, not open, uh, and with some uh, re remuneration for the work that was done, but controlling uh, how much uh, product was to be uh, presented by the individual uh, architectural uh, teams to the um, board of trustees. And uh, Chen Li was involved in the buildings uh, and Lands and Buildings Committee at the time. And I think was impressed with the idea of, we shouldn't just select one architect and go forward, nor should we turn this into a worldwide competition, which could be very, uh, and at least in some people's minds, uh, kind of a confusing process uh, without enough restraint to give a fair way uh, of assessment for particularly uh, the members of the board and most members of boards of trustees are not design professionals. Uh, it's very, very rare in fact. Uh, and so therefore uh, people that are very successful in their own fields of law and business and whatever um, are not used to looking at proposed architectural uh, solutions. So at Stanford with the support of the president of course and the board, uh, we developed a process that we uh, had probably done at least 10 or 12 competitions prior to Asia Society. And so Chen had been involved in several of those. And I remember him calling me and asking me to meet uh, at the Stanford uh, main quadrangle, if you're familiar with that, the historic center of that campus. And we walked around and he talked to me about the idea of developing the project for the Asia Society in Hong Kong. And what did I think of the idea of actually developing a design competition similar to what was done at Stanford uh, for that project? I was thrilled. <laughs> uh, 
I had never been to Hong Kong. That's, of course, one one reason I was thrilled. But of course, I uh, Chen being a very highly respected member of the board of trustees, for him to ask me to do something like that, I was absolutely yes, I will do this. And um, I talked to uh, the president Casper and asked if it was acceptable to him for me to do that. And I remember him smiling at me and saying, yes, anything that brings Stanford to the world is good for Stanford. And so the idea that we were gonna bring a process that had been very successful Hmm. at the campus and bring it to another uh, setting. Uh, Stanford is of course, uh, has historic structures and a historic context. And so we basically followed um, without, as a private institution, without the governmental requirement, but we followed it nonetheless, uh, the Secretary of Interior's standards in the United States, which is basically the grounding for how to treat uh, historic property, uh, facilities and landscape. And so, I, uh, Chen put me in touch with Mary Lee Turner and uh, a lot of information started to flow uh, across the digital divide, so to speak. Uh, And we, I became familiar very quickly with uh, the site from, you know, quite a distance, but I mean, the notion of the complexities of the site, Mm -hmm. uh, be it the, I would almost call it jungle environment that existed there, uh, the historic structures and the NULA, which was of course a very functional uh, uh, infrastructure piece that ran through the site. Uh, David, would if you I like to ask start me? the slides for you? Ah, sure, please. Great. I just thought I'd give some background because I almost feel uh, <clears throat> As I did a couple of years ago, I was interviewed at Stanford uh, for oral history. And I feel after 20 years, I'm giving oral history. So I want to be as uh, straightforward and accurate as I can recall and represent both uh, my uh, remembrance of this and my engagement with uh, the other people involved in this process. So this was uh, what Mary Lee uh, sent me from the society. Uh, Mm -hmm. Basically, this is what we were charged with doing. Uh, And I'd highlight the fact that it says the project's international scale of importance, historic value, and unique urban location. All of those things are very critical to this project. And with that, um, next please. Um, These were the uh, players, the selection committee. Uh, you see Chen Li, who I've mentioned, and of course, Ronnie Chan was the chairman and is still very much involved. Mary Lee was a director at the time. And uh, John or Jack Wadsworth, honorary chairman for Morgan Stanley, who was in San Francisco. He was a um, knew Richard Weinstein very well, mm-hmm. and he put the two of us together. And uh, Jack is still a colleague that I stay uh, associated with. But he was a very, you can imagine, at Morgan Stanley, very down to earth person. We have to get this on a schedule and a budget and let's move forward. So with that and uh, the year 2001, we moved forward. Next, please. And here's uh, uh, Remembrance of Richard. I I like his uh, t-shirt. I picked this on purpose, don't mess with success. (laughs) The idea we started with was we weren't gonna mess with success if the process that I'd worked on with Chen at uh, Stanford had been very successful, let's, mm-hmm. let's make it work. Right. And uh, Richard's vast knowledge uh, from being the Dean or former Dean at the time uh, of UCLA. And he and I both shared a lot of Los Angeles connections, uh, which were and still are a very interesting group of Uh, architects, landscape architects and planners. And so I remember meeting with Richard in his home in Santa Monica one Sunday afternoon and spending about six hours uh, going through all sorts of uh, materials, most of them books, magazines and the like, as well as slides, uh, if you can remember that ancient technology. Um, And we looked at several hundred options 
around the world. Next, please. Of who we might consider to recommend to invite to the uh, competition. Um, so we also talked about the scope and the location. Um, and I've already mentioned that, but of course the complexity of being in a very urban environment, uh, yet being able to walk uh, to the business district and wanting to connect with the green uh, linkage that ran through Hong Kong and make this a major asset from that regard, as well as a cultural asset in general. Next. Of course, service preservation. And, uh, you know, 1843. Uh, so these were buildings that were 100 and almost 160 years old, some of them, mm -hmm. uh, and represented a certain era, obviously, of colonial history in Hong Kong. Um, and this notion of being able to revitalize and reuse these facilities uh, for cultural heritage purposes, uh, as well as just preserving the history that was there. Next. Uh, sustainability wasn't as large a topic as it is today, but it was a, a, an evolving topic. And of course, uh, issues like uh, climate control, the notion of stormwater management, the notion of uh, adaptive reuse of structures rather than starting from scratch to reduce uh, what we now would call carbon footprint was uh, very much in our minds at the time. And um, also the fact that we learned as we progressed that there was an endangered species on the site as well. Next. So David, you mentioned restraints. Um, so what were some of the parameters that you guys put in, especially for this um, very special site? Well, the notion of adaptive reuse was key. Um, thank you. <laughs> and the, the notion that this would become something that could be an example uh, in particular to Southeast Asia because of the network that the Asia Society had at the time. I'm sure it's broader than that by now, but um, inclusive of even, of course, Australia and New Zealand, but also the notion that not everything had to be new, that things could be re adaptively reused and they could be done in such a way that they would be teaching the lesson of cultural history and you know the good and not so good of that cultural history. Uh, which we have, of course, in the United States as well. But the idea of the, that colonial history and that somehow those structures that had meant uh, something of governance and uh, I would add domination at that point in time could now be used for something that was open and adapted to new uses that shared uh, uh, cultural experiences among the various participants that would come to the Asian society over time. Thank you. Next. Are they, uh, when we sat down that Sunday afternoon that I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, we actually looked at, by our count, more than 200 different architectural forms. Uh, uh, and we reduced that number to 40. We were delegated with that responsibility, which is pretty amazing <laughs> when I look back on it. Uh, but that's what the com committee said to us. You tell us who are the 40 that we should, re or not 40, but who are the group that we should request information uh, about how they'd respond to, to our site and what we knew of at that time, our program, which was based on a program that of course existed in Hong Kong at the Asia Society in Reddit space. Uh, surprisingly of the 40, a number didn't respond. And um, it could have been 20 years ago that a number of firms just only wanted to build new buildings. And the idea of trying to work with all these constraints wasn't attractive to them. Um, but you can see, we looked at Europe, we looked at Asia, we looked at uh, North America, including Mexico and Canada. Um, I'm not sure why we didn't look beyond that, but remember it was 20 years ago. Yeah. And of course now I think it would be easy to say we should have included uh, 
Australia, New Zealand, Africa, of course, South America, of course. But the list uh, that we had of the 200 is really focused in these areas. And it's probably, I have to admit, because of what was being publicized 20 years ago, mm -hmm. that things were not as, you know, we weren't as digital then, of course. Right. And a lot of the publications were centered in the areas that are, have the orange circles. So therefore we had a concentration of consultants, potential consultants. How uh, long did this shortlisting take? How long did, I'm sorry, the shortlisting? The shortlisting, list? this shortlisting. From, 40, from 200 to 40? Yeah. How it long happened did... in a day. It happened oh, wow. in a day. Okay. I'm not kidding. It was a six hour meeting. Mm -hmm. um, Richard's wife brought us snacks so we could keep going, but it was uh, kind of like an all nighter, but only it was from about noon until uh, twilight. Mm -hmm. um, and we came up with these 40 and we use the constraints that we just showed you, you know, uh, people that are firms that had worked in historic settings, people that had worked in uh, areas of uh, urbanity that was very concentrated and so forth. So uh, it was an incredible delegation to us and we took it incredibly seriously. Uh, although I have to say, uh, we got to know each other very well and uh, established a, a repartee that um, uh, uh, lasted until Richard's passing. Uh, from the 40, I don't think we got many more than 14 that were complete responses, uh, maybe 20, but some of them lacked information and so forth. And again, we were delegated from, from the uh, committee, Asia Society, a committee to actually recommend who what the shortlist would be. And we had a considerable discussion about should the shortlist be four or five or should the shortlist be fewer. And we came to the conclusion that if four or five may be more than was needed, if we uh, picked three prospects that had a diverse diversity, in terms of what they would bring to the program. Uh, and to be honest, I can't remember how we resolved that specifically. I just know that we both felt in the, in, intuitively and experientially that uh, fewer would be better in terms of making a presentation to again, a group of very intelligent, very experienced uh, members of a selection committee. And I remember at least saying to, um, uh, Richard, that at Stanford, we very seldom went over three in terms of who we invite, but occasionally we would go to four or five if we thought there was a real uh, dramatic difference that could be constructed in that regard. Mm -hmm. So next, we recommended then, um, well, first of all, <laughs> we before I recommend tell you who we recommended, I adapted the request for proposal that we had been using at Stanford. And the, the basic thing I already mentioned to you was level playing field. And, uh, you know, having been in Hong Kong, that could be for cricket, uh, it could be for soccer. Uh, but uh, in the, uh, you know, the notion that you can't tilt it one way or another, you want to make it very fair. So if you have a firm that has, you um, maybe 300 employees and you have a firm that has like 15, uh, you wanna make it fair for the 15 as well as the 300. So what we developed at Stanford and I uh, adapted for this RFP was uh, that there were only a limited number of drawings that could be submitted and they needed to be uh, clearly defined. So we said, you know, four elevations and so forth, you know, a roof plan, but no more. And that there could only be two perspectives and that they couldn't use even at that time, any um, video technology at, that was burgeoning uh, even 20 years ago. Uh, we wanted to make it so fair that um, I actually had the models built, the base models built to the same scale, of course, in San Francisco. And we actually shipped those models to each of the consultant 
uh, teams, uh, competitors. And we actually prescribe the type of paint, the, t- <laughs> the type of uh, artificial landscape that was involved and sent them those materials. So when you see the models in a few minutes, you're going to say, boy, they all look pretty much the same in terms of their characteristics. That was exactly the, the intent. We didn't right. want the, um, I'll call them lay jury to be influenced by something that was a different scale or a different color or a different so forth. We wanted it as fair and competitive as possible. And the feedback I got when I was at Stanford from the competitors, even the ones that lost, <laughs> felt that that was the fairest competition they'd ever been in because they didn't feel they had a second guess what the other firms were going to do in terms of submission. So that's my, my, yeah. You can see there are a lot of attachments, including the existing plans, uh, the special conservation survey, Mm -hmm. uh, CD. We had a CD with about 50 site photos, the mission statement and so forth. And we had an initial program statement, which uh, was, pretty basic the way I remember it. And then um, we uh, had this as a a competition where the competitors would meet each other. So we didn't try to sequester one from the other. Uh, The notion was to have some sort of social engagement. And we did on the visits, visit to Hong Kong. We also had, of course, a private session with each firm with the selection committee where they could expose their initial ideas about the site and the buildings, how they were going to and test the water, if you will. Uh, mm. And that's not uncommon in, in invited competitions, but we stressed it to a great degree that we wanted, we thought the best ideas from the owner's perspective would come if people uh, were together in certain instances and were separate in other instances. So next mm. I'll move more quickly now. These were the selection criteria. Uh, I don't think there's anything there that's too unusual. Um, The notion of future flexibility is always put into something like this and is always difficult to define. Uh, The sensitivity to long-term operating costs This is probably one of the most difficult competitions. I've I've done 22 design competitions and uh, 21 of them are built. Um, And the the whole notion of operating costs and ease of construction on this site and given your climatic conditions is is a really difficult challenge, particularly at this stage of a design competition. Sustainability, we wanted them to interpret that beyond what I already mentioned. And obviously, Uh, the whole reference related to client interaction was incredibly important as well. Next. So here were the short list. Uh, We diversified, as you can see, around the globe. Um, The the Spanish firm, uh, Torres and La Pena, had much more engagement with historic structures. Uh, The sauna firm had some engagement and Williamson Chen honestly had the least engagement with historic structures, but they definitely had urban environment experience. Next. So we had a first visit to the site and they got to meet the staff and they met, they they had a first round interview with the selection committee. Uh, And this was one-on-one, this was not a group engagement. But we did, uh, thanks thanks to uh, some of the members of the selection committee uh, entertained us at some fabulous, uh, two fabulous dinners <laughs> and everybody got to know each other. And um, I think architects need to have a little more of that and a little less kind of isolation from each other, to be honest. So the next, please. So then um, these were the private meetings and a design check-in and I saved some of the correspondence. And that's what you would expect it would be. Uh, they actually brought you know, their initial drawings and thoughts on this. And if I, I'm pretty sure we spent 
at least two hours with each firm, which is the selection committee having that dialogue. Next. And then the presentations. And here you can see the models are very similar. Some of them didn't, uh, some painted them green, some painted them black, some painted them white. And when you, uh, but it's the same model base uh, as you go around and you can start to see the similarities and the differences in those submissions, which I don't have time tonight to go into, but uh, uh, one was, you can see the connection between the two different areas of the explosive magazine site. And again, each team had a significant amount of time to make their presentation one-on-one -on -one with the selection committee. Next. So the final competition winner was uh, Todd Williams, Billy Chen. Um, and uh, I'll show you in the next slides why the jury felt this was the best selection process. Again, the bridge was a given. It was where the bridge was going to be located that was maybe more dramatic in this one. Uh, they felt the jury, there was not, it, it was not an argumentative session. There was pretty much consensus with the jury mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the three presentations. And these were the reasons. Uh, they felt that it was very uh, uh, intelligible for, for the visitor or the guest to the Asian society to figure out how to get from one place to the other. Um, and that was really important. And the notion of how to counteract or if, if nothing else, respond to the British embassy was really important because that's a very dominant, at least my recall, fairly dominant structure. And uh, the notion of creating kind of a, a shaded, um, kind of almost classical sort of entry, uh, if you think of Greek and Roman architecture, uh, into the space with the colonnade and the idea of getting in and under and kind of, I describe it as an Akito response to the British embassy. It's like, you can't push back against that building very easily. You have to kind of accept the strength of it and say, now we're gonna to respond to it by letting it do our own work. And the notion of the landscape was important. The rooftop garden was uh, actually, there were uh, Torres and La Pena had a version of that too, but this seemed more accessible, particularly to the view shed uh, down the valley uh, towards the harbor. And um, that was, a, I think most people really saw that as an incredible asset. And the idea that it was, and there was a sense of protecting the site from the surroundings, which are very strong. And so that notion of a quiet, I'm not sure that means acoustically quiet as much as it means quiet in terms of the view shed and so forth. Mm -hmm. Next. If, if, my, if I may interrupt. Oh, sure. Uh, we see that in the, in the three uh, chosen shortlist here, there are maybe a very different approach uh, among the three. What were the sort of deciding um, characteristic that made you guys you know, pick these three to sort of pursue? Um, well, I think you see more uh, similarity with, um, you know, the bridge was the big definer here. Right. And the, the notion of going across, I'll call it the gulch, <laughs> Mm -hmm. and uh, the landscape that was there. And of course, there's a requirement for not disturbing that central area. But I think the drama of that bridge and its relationship of the two clusters of buildings was really a keen point. And the vista, again, if you look down the gulch, which I'm sure you all have, it's, right. it's very, very dramatic. Now, you know, I haven't been back to Hong Kong in 10 years or uh, so, or nine years. So um, I'm not sure what else has been built down below and how much how much has been filled in uh, further much. to build more. No, good, uh, that's good. But of course, the historic context here is that there was that little tramway 
that mm -hmm. ran around the magazines. Right. But then there was actually a gondola system that went from the magazine area um, down to the harbor where the shells, if you will, the artillery shells were loaded onto the uh, frigates, uh, mm. the, the British Navy that were anchored down there. So that, that, that gulch is incredibly important from a historic site con uh, context, even though the gondola, of course, is not there anymore. That's amazing. But the, yes, I agree the, the bridge from Billy Shen's and Tom Williams proposal, the view above the gorge is really one of the great deciding factor and yeah, one of the still most amazing moments in Hong Kong's architecture. Mm. And if you look at it, how it aligns with the entry, which is the, you know, kind of gold colored piece, mm. um, it, it, again, this orientation idea that you could come in, you could turn left to the offices, you could go, you know, through the security area and onto the bridge and up to the real cultural history areas of the uh, powder magazine. It's just, it just, it was, that's why it said direct and strong. That's exactly what the jury recognized in it. So um, we can go forward. I think I started about 30. 30 minutes ago, so I was going to try to wrap up here, but here the, the interpretation of how to use the existing structures, we can go through these pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And the magazines, which of course are different, very different in architecture. Right. And the existing conditions in 2001 and next. And then the, the notion of the new building or the pavilion and the vista point and the bridge next. And then this um, was developed in February for the timeline and I won't go into details here other than to say that when we started the project and looking back at the, or when I got involved in the project, excuse me, the schedule in the design competition brief was that we were actually going to be finished at the end of 2003. In other words, a two year construction period. Um, uh, that proved to be not, not correct. <laughs> Let's put it that way without being critical. But a lot of um, fundraising, practical, uh, bureaucratic involvement, also practical. People worried about protecting the historic assets as well as uh, protecting the historic site and the fruit bats uh, was very important. But then you see the construction work was actually five years and not two, which isn't the least bit surprising when you think about it, uh, given the circumstances of that site and how to manipulate it without destroying the site, as well as without destroying or uh, injuring the uh, historic buildings. I mean, it, it, it's an unbelievable logistics problem that was there. And someday I'd like to talk to someone that was involved in the construction directly to just understand the logistics of it and whether they did any time-lapse photography or not, which I've never seen of how they, how they dealt with that site. It mm -hmm. must have involved several tower cranes. That's the only thing I can think of how you would do it without destroying that uh, site. Uh, next. So as you can see, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary. Uh, I was involved in this process because Architectural Resources Group are colleagues of mine, uh, mm -hmm. and they were working with me at Stanford. And so when the Asia Society asked me who should do the conservation report, I recommended them because A, they're very good, and B, we wanted to make sure that we were going to follow uh, uh, the Borough Agreement, um, which is Australian, but it's also... Uh, adapted in most of the world um, as compared to the British system, which is more uh, restrictive in terms of what you can do to a building, even if it's reversible, uh, meaning that you could take it away at some point in time and still have the original structure. So at any rate, this is, uh, 
the work that they did. They didn't finish it until 2005, as you can see. So they were actually working with the Asia Society with uh, uh, Williamson Chen, and they were working with Arup uh, in Hong Kong, who did a lot of the legwork on this project for this project. I mean, for this part of the project. Next. Uh, this is just uh, documents uh, that I had from the Asia Society of the opening and uh, kind of mm -hmm. uh, be useful for people if they're interested in looking at how the, the layout of the project on the model and how it's interpreted in uh, aerial photography. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much turned out the way the model looked. <laughs> There's a few things if you compare them that are different, but not much. Anyway, next. Definitely change in geometry compared to the model. Uh, yeah, the bridge in particular. Mm -hmm. And that had to do, I understood, and I'm not the person to really ask the detail on this, but constructability issue of how to actually build that bridge as opposed to going, you know, kind of directly across mm -hmm. uh, to the laboratory building. But I, the drama of it is quite nice. I'm sure it wasn't. Uh, I'm sure it was more expensive to do it that way, but I think it was a consideration related to site preservation. Yes. Next. And then you can go through these quickly. It's just a before and after sort of uh, version. You can see in more detail the, the state of those buildings. Here's the, the tr tracks for that little um, tram that carried the explosives around the site. And I guess maybe one or two more. Yeah, the pavilion from the underside. Again, quite dramatic. Now just quickly, I thought people might be interested in seeing what uh, Williams and Chen and the other two competitors have done since. This is the proposal from Williams and Chen for the new US embassy in Mexico City. Um, and that's not built as yet. It's supposed to be started, uh, const start construction this year. But you can start to see some, if you study it as an architect anyway, you can start to see some similarities in terms of the way they treat massing and the like and integrate, of course, some landscape in this case. The next is sauna. And the... Uh, this is, I picked this because it's somewhat analogous to the buildings at, that they proposed at uh, uh, Asia Society. Uh, they very much like white in their construction. They very much like simple volumes, although often put into very, uh, like this one, uh, dramatic uh, relationships and uh, simple fenestration or window placement. And this is an addition to a historic building in New York City. So it's interesting to see, uh, you see how they're keeping the relationship of the horizontal uh, on the uh, four levels, but certainly much more dramatic in terms of the vertical. Mm -hmm. And they of course won the Pritzker prize, which uh, at least in the United States is seen as a very strong, uh, significant architectural recognition and they won that in 2014. Mm -hmm. I should mention that we only worked with uh, Sejima uh, on the project. We didn't work with her partner mm -hmm. uh, at the time in 2003, they split the projects apart. So we dealt with, with her on all of our engagement. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, Martinez, La Pena and Torres. Um, <laughs> again, uh, this, slide maybe doesn't do it justice. It's in a historic district in Barcelona. So all the buildings around it are, um, you know, two and three century old buildings. Uh, and this dramatic composition is what they placed in the middle of it. And again, it's a cultural center. So I thought it was um, interesting to see. They, they probably pushed their architecture further than either of the other two competitors since they uh, competed in 2003, if you look at the mm -hmm. work. And they've done a number of restoration works on uh, older um, uh, Gaudi buildings in Barcelona. So it's a very, almost a regional practice compared to Sana and Williams and Chan at this point. 
I think that's my last slide other than just an aerial view. Last one? Yes. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I've concluded and i am got 15 more minutes to answer questions and I certainly will answer any questions I get by way of email. Great. Thank you, Rick. So, yeah. Thank being you so my, much. For being my trigger man and pulling at slides. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much, David, for showing us, you know, this process of how Asia Society came to be. And I actually didn't tell you before, it was, I think 2005 or 06, when I attended a lecture by um, uh, Todd and Billy. And uh, I think they were first showing some sketches of this project at the time. And I mean, as, as a, uh, a person from Hong Kong, I was like totally shocked. I had no idea that this site actually existed. I think actually many people from Hong Kong didn't realize the whole, the entire history with um, the old Victoria barracks. And uh, there's so many uh, different sites that spans from actually uh, Pacific Place all the way up to uh, Borat Road, where uh, Mother's Choice is currently now. So um, actually the topic of conservation is very timely, uh, especially this year in Hong Kong. Uh, earlier uh, in the year, uh, there was a discovery of um, the Bishop Hill Reservoir, and soon they will come into the spotlight, which is the general post office that is right um, at the um, City Hall, uh, Star Ferry area, and that's going to mm -hmm. generate a lot of conservation uh, conversation as well. So, drawing from your experience, uh, you know, in all these projects and also in Stanford, how do you weigh um, the uh, sort of adaptive reuse strategy over, for example, if Asia Society were to find a new home elsewhere in a new building, how do you weigh um, the priorities or how do you judge that, um, the differences between these two approaches? Hmm. Good question. Um, I was following along with you until you said if Asia Society found a new site. <laughs> so I guess, <laughs> Since this is 20 years old, uh, at least in, in the um, United States, the, the notion, uh, there are four characteristics. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, the uh, cultural significance of the site and the existing facilities. So obviously we preserve uh, the, bear, the uh, mil Amazing. military complex, yeah. And um, so then the question would be, the second question has to do with uh, relationships to um, persons of significance in history. Mm -hmm. I, I would think one of the things that would be important here was all of the activities that have occurred over the last 20 years and who the uh, guests were and what were the conferences or the exhibits or the you know, historically significant activities that might have occurred in association with the new building as well as the older buildings. Uh, there's also the issue of archeology. span And when you go back to 1843 for the uh, one part of the, the, the magazine, uh, that, you know, that's approaching 200 years, not too, not too far off here. Uh, so archaeology might still be a part of what could be found there in terms of um, what were the um, cultural uh, attitudes and so forth. And I'm not sure that at that 200 years or 180 years ago, but also the notion of um, what else might be on this site that we haven't discovered. Mm -hmm. uh, that could even be what's often called prehistory. I have, I personally have a problem with prehistory because it associates itself with the current history, right? Okay. And says that there's something that happened that we don't consider to be that significant anymore. And of course, uh, indigenous peoples in different continents are deal with that all the time. Uh, but um, I think that, you know, if this bill, if this complex had to have another life, I think that it should be taught, thought of as a complex that interpreted history in such a way that it should be preserved and again, adaptively reused. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what kind of activities would be other than what is there right now, but I'm sure some someone would think of something that could be done 
that would be different from the current level of activity uh, and not necessarily be a public building. Mm -hmm. So is it my, am I answering your question or I mis, misconstrue no, I, it? I guess what I mean is, you know, this is really the best fit, the best use that, you know, this site could have hoped for. Um, you know, a institute that really celebrate uh, culture, history, and art. And um, I think, you know, the site definitely gives it a unique uh, temporal dimension that other sites would not offer. And I think this is something that, you know, maybe Hong Kong people did not immediately um, appreciate um, or to, to recognize that, you know, the history that comes with the site is as important as, you know, what we built on it. If we don't preserve, you know, particular site at the 160 years mark, you will never get to the 400 year mark. And um, that's yeah, right. Right. So, yeah, I think, yeah, your, your, uh, I, I think the adaptive reuse was really on our minds, um, Richard and mine, I'm saying, it certainly was with the Asia Society, but I mean, I, I visited some of the, the barracks buildings that have been preserved and they're like museum, you know what I mean? They're not, they're not, yes, that's interesting. And we should have artifacts that are preserved in that case, but adaptive reuse brings a new life to it. And I think a critical thinking to the site that wouldn't happen if it was just, if those buildings had been uh, the ones up on the, you know, with the tile roof I'm looking at, not the barracks building down below, but if they had just been preserved mm -hmm. and made into an artifact, I don't think it would be as important to the future of Hong Kong as this reuse of those structures where you turn in some turn something that was meant to be an instrument of war like the powder magazine and you turn it into an art museum yes. and you turn it into a theater i mean that's just like the old expression of you know swords into plowshares if you've heard that expression before it's uh, maybe yes. limited to uh the u.s or i think it comes from um Europe, but the idea of you can create, take something that was designed to create munitions and turn it into something that's creating peace, if you will, or history uh, associated with cultural exchange. That's yeah, I'm, and I'm sure, you know, that conversation of, you know, convincing the government uh, sort of maybe let's say away from pure preservation to adaptive reuse, that's right. definitely a very important one and uh, you have, must have coughed through a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of um, naysayers in order to get you know what we want to do on this side to be done and along that that same line I, I want to ask you actually this is a question from uh, AIA Hong Kong what do you think or how do you think the final uh, projects stack up to the original intent from the architect oh yeah It'd be interesting to ask them. Um, well, how about your interpretation? I think the I think the, I think the um, the programmatic outcome. One of the things I guess I would have to say I'd want to know is uh, the utilization of the facility, mm -hmm. uh, not just be not now because of COVID, but I mean because of uh, say 2019, because um, there was a really um, strong emphasis on the programming here and how that programming was going to be able to occur, you know, without not like an art museum where you might have to close it down to change the, the exhibits, but this was going to be something that was constantly in use, constantly in use for, um, people in Hong Kong that wanted to uh, rent the facilities for various activities. Mm -hmm. uh, but constantly in use in terms of cultural exchange, as well as the general public being able to move through the building. So I think um, in my work work with Williams and Chen, they were definitely took that to heart with the idea that there was some separation that could occur in the structure that would allow for areas to be continually used while other things were changing. Mm -hmm. if you know, and I'm you know talking about exhibits in particular. I'm also talking about conference activities that might require security 
uh, in certain areas that would not be there on a daily basis and so forth. And that sort of programming flexibility was a key uh, in how they located uh, the various activities on the site uh, so that there could be that continual use of uh, the, the complex and not have to shut down one part of it or another and therefore you couldn't uh, activate or use parts that were adjacent to it. Uh, <coughs> I think that, excuse me, I think that would be very, very important to the architects um, to know what that was, how that occurs on a daily basis or will again after COVID. Is that, am I getting to your point on that one, Rick? Yeah, definitely. Um, and actually I, I saw in the previous correspondence uh, from, well, I guess between Billy and uh, Asia Society that she said that it's decidedly a quiet scheme and what is not right. said is as important as what is said. So what do you think are some of the points that are maybe not said and maybe some points that the general public may not you know, realize immediately, but it was um, intrinsic or implicit in the architecture itself? Well, I think if you look at Williams and Chin's uh, landscape in general, or I mean, work in general, the integration of landscape, which I think this image really portrays, uh, landscape and vista and the whole notion that you could be in a very urban environment, but here you could be in a sense quiet as in, quiet as in contemplative, mm -hmm. even though the the sound might still be there of traffic and of the, it, it almost would seem like um, a backdrop mm -hmm. because of the way they framed the vistas and the way they integrated it with the landscape. And again, I point to that bridge. I mean, you know, if you would, if you would have connected the laboratory to the pavilion mm -hmm. in the easy way <laughs> up <laughs> on the top of that image, it would not have the same impact. Right. that this building does. And the whole notion of trans tra traversing the site on those bridges. And uh, frankly, I think this is of course more dramatic than the competition model was the way it frames those vistas and the quietness, the, the, the quietness of being in this, you know, green space and being able to step out of, you know, if you, I know if you walk, down the slope there and you get into the hotel complex and everything, it's very, very active space. And if you turn at the British embassy and go along the hillside there, it's a very, very active space. And of course you're not far away from the retail nature of the area and the, the tourist orientation of the area and so forth. At least again, I haven't been there for nine years, but I'm yeah. assuming it's similar. Um, so I think the notion of quiet and contemplation and the notion of Vista can be seen in this building, including the rooftop garden, of course, mm -hmm. um, and the waterfall that's there. Right. And yes. the, it, in the interior of the historic complex, although uh, some of the landscape had to be removed because mm -hmm. of uh, uh, creatures, <laughs> uh, the, the fact was that the idea of keeping these uh, volunteer trees that had grown up in there at, to give scale to the buildings and to give it a, again a presence of quiet. And mm -hmm. I think that that's definitely a part of what's going on here. Right, the, and the ju jury, The jury or the, kind of the selection committee definitely understood that. Right, the site is somewhat hidden, but then it really borrows you know, from the larger view of the entire Hong Kong into the bridge area and also the pavilion area. And the idea of quiet actually, uh, by employing a, a very clever relationship with the NOLA, the sound of the water, and then there's also the uh, yeah. water in the complex, really drowns out the traffic noise around it. And uh, yeah, what you really sense is the greenery and also maybe you know, the sound of uh, really a small part of nature that is in the middle of Hong Kong, the, the jungle, like you said. Right. Great. Now it's, it's, it, it was an island in the storm, as someone described it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, so here's another question. If given the chance, 
Is there anything that you would change about the process or even about the, the outcome of the architecture? Any suggestions that you would make along the way? Uh, I think the process, you know, of the competition process went according to plan. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not we would have benefited by having one or two entries that might have given us even more diversity of response. Um, can always question that. Was there uh, someone that else from somewhere else that could have been a part of this that might have had another response? Um, someone asked me why there was no um, uh, British architect involved since it was uh, proximate to the handover um, and that they would have had some of them, British architects would have had experience like the simple one that was said to me because I've worked with Norman Foster on two projects that was asked, why wasn't Norman Foster involved? Um, a simple answer, I th and certainly the Foster's office has worked with historic buildings as have a number of British architects. It, it just seemed the scale of this space to Richard and I required someone that thinks at kind of that scale Mm -hmm. of architecture rather than has a more, let's call it diverse practice. And there were several architects that we would have probably liked to have had involved like Alvaro Siza, um, but he didn't respond. <laughs> and uh, so there were, and who knows why, but at mm -hmm. any rate, we kind of got, you know, uh, tourism and opinion, I wouldn't call Alvaro Siza, but on the other hand, we got a kind of that that sort of some perspective towards that Mediterranean architecture. So I think a second guessing that might have gone on, at least in my head, was could we have brought maybe two others to this mm -hmm. stage that might have provided with another not not better at all, but another vision right. that could have been interesting, particularly in twenty years retrospect, for people to look at. As far as the building itself, and um, I have been up on the uh, elevated terrace uh, with waterfall um, when the temperature and the sun angle was rather severe. And uh, I've always felt that it might have been uh, programmatically, we might have required that something that was that exposed had some sort of a shading device. Mm -hmm. Whether, whether it was uh, something that could be manipulated, like automated, so it wasn't there all the time, or whether it was something that just architecturally could have worked with that space to provide uh, shade up there, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when it gets to be 100 Fahrenheit and uh, 90 humidity. Uh, so that would have been, and I've mentioned that to Todd and Billy actually um, oh. along the way and uh, I, I, I wouldn't say they were excited that I pointed that out, but on the other hand, I don't think they thought it was such a bad idea. So at any rate, uh, that would have been the only critique I would give. I think the interior spaces are work very well every place I've been in the complex. And as I already said earlier, I think the entry is a really good response to what you see there is the British embassy on the other side of the road uh, in terms of kind of a response, as I said, maybe I should say a yin and a yang thing and a Chinese reference, uh, at least as an American might say. But uh, the idea of kind of backing away from that and not trying to compete with it, I thought was a really strong element. And uh, again, there was shade when you walk into mm -hmm. that space, so. Great. David, do you have one, do you have time for one more question? Sure. Great. Um, so this question is about actually education. Um, drawing from your 40 years of experience, now how do you think um, the dimension of preservation should work itself into um, the education of an architect and also maybe the, gen the education of, it, of the general public? Well, um, I was involved in a conversation just uh, today um, in the US about uh, Histor historic architecture 
representing uh, the step forward towards um, being more carbon neutral in terms of a building that's already had a huge investment in uh, uh, embedded car carbon. And I'd even point to the British embassy across the way there, uh, assuming that's precast or cast in place concrete. And that to tear those buildings down is mm -hmm. to waste so much uh, of embedded energy and then to have to replace them with more energy. So some of the modeling that I've seen recently that's um, uh, going to be available actually online and for free would be able to model a uh, adaptive reuse of an existing structure, including the bringing up the infrastructure aspects of it um, to a more contemporary standard, meaning, of course, H heating, ventilating, air conditioning. Um, but to do it in a to do it with contemporary thinking in terms of the products and the process that you would use to do that, but maintain the existing structure and not just because they were historically significant, but they could be workaday structures that um, could be adaptively developed and would lessen the carbon footprint of the building even over time. So that if you look at it as a life cycle, of 30, 40 years for building systems, that preserving the old building and adapting it with new systems is much more effective than in terms of carbon, uh, uh, than tearing it down and starting over, even though we know so much more than we did, you know, even 20 years ago about sustainable and resilient practices. So I think it has a major to get back to your point, I think it should be a, a major part of architects' education to learn things from that perspective rather than, oh, we have to do everything new because it's going to be better than the old. I think there's something that's in between, which is to reuse what we already have invested in and make it better that way uh, rather than starting over. So I would recommend that the master's programs at MIT and uh, Columbia and Harvard and uh, my alma mater, Michigan, uh, ought to have that as a requirement as part of uh, not just the graduate degree, but uh, undergraduates too that have uh, that they have an undergraduate program. Uh, and I think it'll get. I think it's really starting, um, uh, starting to be embedded in to use that term, in mm -hmm. the practice um, in a number of areas. And I would hope that it would spread worldwide, frankly. Right. Great. Thank you so much, David. And um, I think we are all very grateful that you and Richard and the selection committee, you know, really, you know, had this vision for Asia society and that, you know, being able to realize it, you know, over a 10 year process is really no small feat. And um, yeah, I think, uh, we are all yeah, very happy that, you know, this building is, you know, in this particular location, a gem, a hidden gem in the city, and uh, it's going to be a sustainable project, as we can see, is standing up very well. The next time you visit, you will definitely come here and have a, have a drink, you have a dinner, and uh, you'll see that the building is standing up very well and surely will last for, you know, decades and, you know, hundreds of years to come in this very special site. Oh, thank you. That's, uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to be involved in this. And as I've tried to say in the last, you know, now an hour, that um, we were trying to look at the, the aspirations and goals of the Asian society and in the broadest sense, and also what it would mean to the, to the uh, Hong Kong itself Mm -hmm. and the thousands, if not millions of visitors that will uh, go through this space and uh, see what I've tried to describe, which is as uh, human aspiration at its best. I'll stop at that. Thank you so much, David. So on that, I think it's probably time for this webcast to come to a close. Um, thank you, David, again, for sharing with us the journey from the conservation efforts and all the way to the choosing of the winning uh, proposal. I have definitely learned a great deal 
and I'm sure our audience have also benefited greatly from your experience as well. Uh, thank you again to Asia Society and AIA Hong Kong for arranging this event. Uh, we hope that everyone watching uh, had enjoyed our conversation and uh, please feel free to comment, like and share with your friends. So have a great evening and goodbye. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thanks to the Asia Society for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Bye now.